from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for coming on such a beautiful day, but I, I'm sure that uh, this program will, uh, will be well worth your time spent here. Uh, I'm Bill Siddig, Chief of the Library Science, Technology, and Business Division, and this event is one in our series in which we learn from important uh, writers and practitioners in the various fields of science, technology, and business. Before I introduce today's speaker, I'd like to mention uh, just a few of our upcoming programs. On September 28th, Holly Shimizu, Executive Director of the U.S. Botanic Garden, uh, who spoke here last May when we were interrupted by an evacuation, uh, is going to continue her talk on herbs in the garden. Uh, this time it'll be fall planting herbs rather than spring herbs. Uh, on October 13th, John Beck, who is president of North Star Leadership Group, will speak on his recent book, Got Game, How the Gamer Generation is Reshaping Business Forever. And October 25th, writer Robert Slater will talk about his book, no such thing as overexposure inside the life and celebrity of Donald Trump. <laughs> I trust that you will find each of these programs of interest and that you will be able to attend all or some of them. I'd also like to take this opportunity to thank Tomoko Steen, a re science research specialist in my division, for suggesting this program today and doing all those things to prepare and make this program a success. It is now my great pleasure to introduce today's speaker, Dr. Jonathan McDowell. Dr. McDowell is an astrophysicist at the Harvard-Smithsonian Center for Astrophysics, there he is, in Cambridge, Massachusetts. As a staff member of the Chandra X-ray Center, he studies black holes, quasars, and X-ray sources and galaxies, among other areas of interest to the astronomy community. In addition, in addition to serving as group leader of the Center's Science Data System Group, Dr. McDowell is chair of the Data Models Working Group, for the International Virtual Observatory Alliance, in which role he leads efforts to define international standards for astronomy metadata. Before arriving at Harvard, he earned his BA in mathematics and a P PhD in astronomy at Cambridge University in England, where he spent a good part of his early life. He then worked at the Royal Greenwich Observatory, the Radio Observatory at Jodrell Bank, which is part of the University of Manchester in the United Kingdom, and at NASA's Marshall Space Flight Center in Huntsville, Alabama. In addition to contributing to a number of scientific publications on a wide range of astronomical subjects, he is the editor of Jonathan's Space Report, a free internet newsletter founded in 1989, which provide de technical details of satellite launches. He maintains a website which provides the most comprehensive historical list of satellite launch information, and he is a regular contributing editor to Sky and Telescope magazine. He has been carrying out research on space history topics using original sources, which have recently been declassified by the U.S. Department of Defense and various Russian agencies. In his presentation today, Dr. McDowell will retell the story of the first five years of the space age from the launch of Sputnik to the flight of Yuri Gagarin and President Kennedy's declaration of the moon race, including this information which has only recently uh, come to light. It is my honor to introduce Dr. Jonathan McDowell. Thank you. Thank you, Bill. Thank you. So I want to take you back today, uh, before the time when we were all blasé about the amazing results from space exploration, pictures of alien worlds, commercial space flights, space stations, space telescopes, space shuttles, the moon race. I want to take you back before even John Glenn's pioneering flight to the first American astronaut to orbit the Earth. On May the 25th, 1961, John Kennedy started off the moon race with his speech in which he said that this country should commit itself within that decade of landing a man on the moon and returning him safely to the Earth. But by then, the space age was already in full flow. The first artificial Earth satellite was launched almost 50 years ago in 1957. And so it's a good time now to revisit what those exciting pioneering and primitive early years were like 
uh, because in the past few years, as Bill said, there's a lot of new material became available. The story I can tell today is not the story I would have been able to tell 20 years ago before the fall of the Soviet Union and before the declassification of the early American space program. So that's my goal. I want to digress at the beginning and say, well, how can we say when the space age began? You actually have to understand what space is to decide when you're in it. <laughs> then I want to give you a little bit of a deep view into the early Soviet space program, the different missions that the Soviet Union carried out in this period, and to a lesser extent, because I won't have time, the, um, uh, the details of the early American space program, I'll tell you a few anecdotes about the early satellite technology that we still use today. And I want to then bring it together and ask the question from, from our new viewpoint, who was really winning the space age in 19, the space race in 1961? At the time that Kennedy made his speech, I'm going to argue that the seeds of the eventual United States victory in the space race had already been laid very firmly. And I won't have time for the later developments, I'm sure, but you can ask me later. Um, so let's begin by asking the question, what is space and where does it start? Because I'm a little heretical on this issue. Uh, the, um, uh, it'd be nice if there was a nice little boundary, a custom zone, where you went up and the atmosphere stopped, below it you could breathe, and above it's vacuum of space. But really the atmosphere just kind of peters out. So you have to use uh, a number of different arguments to say where should we stop saying this is flight in the atmosphere and where should we say you're in space. And people have used different definitions. There's some people who've put it as low as about 20 miles. Uh, a very popular rule right now is to use 60 miles, 100 kilometers, nice round metric number. Uh, that's what the uh, XPRIZE folks used with the Spaceship One flight uh, last year. I actually think that's a little high, and I would argue for, for about 50 miles, 80 kilometers. Uh, and I, I'll just say there's a couple of different reasons. I think you can argue on historical grounds. You can make arguments on technological grounds and on physical grounds. So if you just look from the technology point of view, how high do things that need the air to fly fly? The highest airplanes go up to about 38 kilometers. The highest balloons, I was actually surprised to discover that the, the height record is higher for balloons than for airplanes. The scientific balloons, uh, without any people on, they just fly scientific experiments way up to the edge of the stratosphere. They go as high as 51 kilometers. See these regions of the atmosphere here that you see. Normally you're flying in the troposphere when you're uh, going across the Atlantic or maybe in the lower stratosphere. But um, right up the top of the stratosphere at 50 kilometers is as high as anything that needs the air can go. Uh, if you come from the top down, there are lots of satellites and spaceships flying at maybe 200 kilometers above the surface of the Earth. And some, if you're in an elliptical orbit, will dip down much lower. And it turns out that you can make many orbits of the Earth dipping down to 90 or even 80 kilometers. But if you try and dip down to 70 kilometers, pretty soon you explode and burn up. And in fact, when you're trying to get rid of something in space, when the Russians get rid of a cargo ship from the International Space Station, they send it into an orbit, they just fire their engines just enough to go into an orbit that dips down to about 70 kilometers. And that's enough to dip it into the atmosphere to make it burn up and re-enter. So, um, uh, uh, so, so I think clearly by then, you're no longer in space. So that's a technological reason. Always a little dangerous to use technological reasons to define a boundary because the technology might change. Um, there's also a historical reason the Air Force gave astronaut wings to the brave X-15 rocket pilots who flew above 50 miles, which happens to be this 80-kilometer boundary. And there's a physics reason, which is the last real physical boundary in the Earth's neutral atmosphere is at the mesopause at 80 kilometers. What happens in the atmosphere is as you go up through the atmosphere, it gets hotter and then there's a discontinuity, or it gets colder, there's a discontinuity, it gets hotter, another discontinuity, it gets colder again. The last such transition layer in the atmosphere is at that 80 kilometer roughly boundary. It depends on the weather exactly how high. Um, and after that, the atmosphere just peters out, the neutral atmosphere. So I, I'm gonna use 80 kilometers as my metric for um, where you start saying you're in space. It doesn't really matter that much, 80, 100, it doesn't change the story a great deal, but I was trained as a mathematician, so I, I'm a pedant. Um, so 
when did we first go into space with that definition? Earlier than you might think, um, the very first flight, the very first time that human beings put something above the Earth's atmosphere was as early as 1942. And we have uh, Mike Neufeld here who's written the definitive book on the uh, history of the V2 rocket program. The German rocket engineer, Werner von Braun, as part of the Nazi war effort, uh, flew this V2 rocket on a test flight uh, up to about 100 kilometers and down into the Baltic. It was only in space for a few minutes. It wasn't in orbit, but it did get into space. So this rocket is the ancestor of very much of the rocket technology we still have today. And it's important for those of us who are enthusiastic about the history of the space program and the great opportunities for our future uh, that space technology provides that we not be silent about the murky morality of the origins of this technology because, of course, Werner von Braun, who was a great hero in this country for building the rockets that got us to the moon, was also, we believe, must have been aware of the deaths in the labor camps uh, that were used to, for the production of the factories uh, uh, of the thousands of these rockets that were fired against London and Paris. So the space program began on a, uh, on a, uh, a murky note, uh, a controversial note. But after the end of the war, very quickly, this technology spread around the world mostly the V2 technology. It then synergized with groups already working on this technology in uh, the United States and in the Soviet Union. And indeed, within a couple years of the end of the war, 1946 in the United States and New Mexico, 1947 uh, in, uh, near Volgograd in Russia, uh, we used captured V2 rockets to make the first American and Russian probes above the atmosphere. But the French also got into the act. They used the same technology as early as 1954 in their base in Algeria, and the Brits developed their own rocket in their Australian base at Woomera by 1957. And very soon after, the uh, uh, Japan, Australia, all these other countries joined in the game. So one thing I want to get across to you is that if you just want to get into space and come back down again a few minutes later, it's really not that hard. And it's not just the story of the two superpowers. The the space exploration began on a very international note, particularly in 1957 with the International Geophysical Year, whose anniversary is, is now approaching, when many scientists all across the world began the sci serious scientific exploration of deep space. But just getting into space for a few minutes isn't the game. You want to be able to stay there. And uh, you, this is what we call being in orbit with a satellite. What's being in orbit? Douglas Adams famously said in The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy that the secret to flying is to throw yourself at the ground and miss. <laughs> and this is exactly what being in orbit is. If you're in orbit, you punch up through the atmosphere in a few minutes. And then you fly sideways, burning a rocket engine for about five more minutes until you've built up so much speed, a magic speed of 18,000 miles an hour, so that by the time you've fallen a mile towards the Earth, you've gone so far sideways that the Earth has curved away from you by a mile and you haven't gotten any closer. And this way, you can fall all around the Earth. This is how the moon stays up. This is how satellites and the space station stay up. It's a lot harder, that extra 18,000 miles an hour sideways. If you look at the energy you need in this plot, this is like my only technical slide, so don't panic. Um, the, uh, um, the little red bar here says how much energy the V2 needed to go on its trajectory into space. In, uh, in um, the units I'm using, one and a half megajoules per kilogram of total energy. In comparison, a satellite at the same height but going all the way around the Earth, because it needs the sideways velocity, needs 20 times as much energy, 31.6 megajoules per kilogram. So it's much harder. It took 15 more years after the first V2 flight to get to the first satellite. And this is why you know, Bert Rutan's uh, amazing Spaceship One, which flew last year uh, to win the X Prize, great achievement, no question. But you have to understand, it's doing the V2 thing, not the satellite thing. It's going to be a while before we have the orbital tourist flights, because the, uh, the technology involved is much harder by this factor of 20. <laughs> 
So we did get that technology. In 1957, the Soviet Union launched the first satellite, Sputnik. And so what I'm going to do now is talk a little bit about that early Soviet program, what we knew then and what we know now. And you can't talk about the early Soviet program without talking about Sergei Pavlovich Korolev, hero of the Soviet Union, the mysterious chief designer of Soviet spaceships, whose identity was kept secret until his death in 1966. Um, and uh, Korolev is the guy who really was behind all of the early Soviet space programs in a big way. There were, in fact, five early Soviet space programs that I'm going to talk about. The Sputnik, the first satellite, the D scientific satellite, which was meant to be the first satellite. It was originally uh, planned to go up first. The lunar moon probes, probes to Mars and Venus, and the Vostok spaceship, which put Yuri Gagarin, the first astronaut, in orbit. There were a couple of other important folks in the early Soviet space program. Um, uh, as well as Korolev, there was a guy called Mikhail Yangel, uh, who had a base in the Ukraine, a, a rocket base, where he designed the R-12 rocket, famous for putting the missile in the Cuban Missile Crisis. And uh, Vladimir Chilome, who worked on military space programs. Uh, but uh, they, um, that at the time, they were working on military missiles. Their space programs didn't really get going until after the cutoff date that I'm considering in the, in the early 60s. Uh, and so uh, really all the early ones were Korolev. I should mention, though, that it's important to understand the Korolev, Yangel, and Chelemai had these three design bureaus, which you could kind of think of like different NASA centers, uh, like, like uh, Goddard and Kennedy Space Center and so on. But they were almost more in their behavior like independent armed services. They got on with each other about as well as the Air Force gets on with the Navy. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and, and they had their own patrons in the Politburo, which, uh, and their, for their uh, fortunes rose and fell uh, with that. If you want to read more about that, I highly recommend uh, uh, a book by Asif Siddiqui, the uh, Apollo, the Soviet Space Challenge, which the folks at the NASA History Office uh, published a few years ago. So I'm going to talk about the Korolev programs in 57 to 61. Of course, the very first orbital launch came about from the first intercontinental ballistic missile. Again, the tight coupling between the military and, and uh, space exploration technologies. Um, the first intercontinental ballistic missile was called the R-7. Uh, American rockets had great names like Atlas and Thor and Jupiter, and the Russians had boring alphanumeric designations, so you have to bear with me. Um, the first launch was in May 1957, and of course it blew up, but of course the Russians quiet, uh, but they, they crowed about the success of the first successful flight of an intercontinental missile in August 1957, an achievement that uh, was greeted with some skepticism by some circles in the West, and they were soon to get a big shock. Korolev had already planned to convert his missile into a satellite launcher. He was going to take the R-7, give it beefier engines, better electronics, and put a one-ton scientific satellite on top. But then he read in the papers that the Americans were going to launch a satellite for the International Geophysical Year called Vanguard. And it was going to happen soon. So they rushed, and in just a few weeks, they made, the, uh, they made a small little satellite, small for them, bigger than the ones we were working on. Uh, here, the, um, the Sputnik, the, the Proshtyshchi Sputnik Odin, the simplest satellite, uh, 80 kilograms. And they just put it on top of the missile they already had, shot it into orbit on October the 4th, 1957. And a few weeks later, they had lying around the lab this cabin for putting dogs on suborbital trajectories on, on rockets like the V2. So they took that, they put a husky dog called Laika and stuffed it on top of the rocket and um, put that into orbit, which was briefly a propaganda coup and then I think turned against them somewhat when people realized that there was no way to get Laika back down. And, Sadly, she died after a few hours in space. This fly seems to really <laughs> like my talk. <laughs> We're just going to pretend it's not there. Um, so after the success of Sputnik, uh, the, um, uh, Korolev carried on with the original satellite rocket he, was meant, uh, he had meant to launch. And it was finally ready in February 1958 by which time Werner von Braun's Explorer 1 satellite had got America back in the game. 
Uh, and here is their, the D satellite, the one ton uh, uh, scientific satellite, launched in February 1958 and immediately blew up. Um, but they had a backup which they launched in May of 1958 and uh, um, it was uh, called, known in the West as Sputnik 3. Uh, the third Soviet satellite, which studied the Van Allen belts, the radiation belts discovered by Jim Van Allen's experiment on the first American satellite explorer. So much more impressive in some ways than Explorer 1, but really scooped by the United States from a scientific point of view. And then nothing happened, apparently, in the Russian program for the rest of that year. Silence until January of 1959, when they announced their first attempt to go to the moon. They launched the Lunar 1 probe, which missed the moon, but became the first artificial planet going around the sun. And in September of that year, they launched another one. This uh, upper right picture here um, is, can you see the pointer? Yeah. yeah. Um, uh, this is Luna 2, which was the first probe that hit the moon and delivered a very important cargo of metal pennants with Lenin's face stamped on them <laughs> that got scattered all over the lunar surface. Uh, the next month, they did something a bit more scientifically useful. They flew a probe around the back of the moon and took the very first photos of the far side, which uh, uh, had never been seen before. That side of the moon is uh, pointed away from the Earth. Um, and so uh, all in all, that program was, was, again, a big propaganda triumph, especially as the United States was not having a lot of luck with its pioneer lunar probes at the time. What we know now is that long-rumored earlier attempts of the Russians to get to the moon in 1958 have now been confirmed. They first tried in September of 58, only a month after the first American launch failure on the, on the subject. And in fact, from 58 to 59, their E-1 lunar probe was launched six times with only two successes. And even more interesting to me, there were, after that success of the far side photos, uh, they launched another two lunar photo probes that were meant to take better pictures because although the lunar three pictures were historically great, they were pretty fuzzy. Uh, and so in April 1960, they launched a couple more probes, both of which failed, but one of which got out to 200,000 kilometers, halfway to the moon, and as far as I can tell, seems to have been completely missed by American tracking. So we had no clue until it was declassified in the 1990s. <laughs> this is the uh, Sputnik rocket with the extra, oh, you can't see where I'm pointing. This is the, the Sputnik rocket with an extra rocket stage and the little moon probe nestled inside the nose cone. They also had a spectacularly unsuccessful series of attempts to get to the Mars and Venus, the other planets. Uh, they launched four, uh, two to Mars in 1960, two to Venus in 1961, uh, and none of them got to their targets. But the U.S. hadn't even tried to launch a probe in that direction yet. The first American uh, Venus probe was in 1962. So at least we can give them marks for effort. Much more successful was the Vostok probe launched in April 1961, the very first uh, human space flight by Yuri Gagarin. You see him on the right here. Uh, launched on this rocket, went round the Earth once in this spherical pressurized cabin. Here's Yuri sitting on the ejection seat and a big retro rocket to boost him down back out of orbit where he could land uh, in a field uh, um, in, uh, uh, in Kazakhstan or in Russia actually. And uh, he gets out in his, he ejects and lands separately on a parachute in this bright orange spacesuit and the farm worker comes up and goes, wow, are you really from outer space? <laughs> uh, 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 and as far as I can translate his reply, it goes, no, I, I'm from Smolensk. I just work in outer space. <laughs> uh, and um, so uh, the, um, but you know, in a few months earlier, in fact, even a month and a half earlier, in March of 1961, if I'd been Yuri Alexeyevich Gagarin, I would have been real worried because the, um, up until that point, they'd had five launches in the Vostok program, of only one of which had been successful. The first launch, the retro rocket fired in the wrong direction. The cabin went up into a higher orbit. The second one crashed near the launch site. The third one, these cute little dogs, Belka and Strelka, became, was a success. They became the first living beings to come back from orbit. But the next two also failed. And it was only in March of 1961, just about a month before Gagarin's flight, 
where they had the uprated version of the spacecraft, they flew it twice that month successfully, and then shot Gagarin off. So it came from a very ropey program to a very successful one very quickly, and after that, uh, they flew five more astronauts in the 61 to 63 period, all successfully. So in the end, a triumph, but by December 1960, they must have been getting pretty nervous. Um, and the Vostok satellite is still in use today, a derivative of it, to fly microgravity experiments. Once they get something that works, they like to keep using it. So that's an overview of the Russian program. All of these projects were done by the Korolev team, and they were all, um, uh, there were just five, these five programs at the time. On the American side, here, this is a great photo. This is the moment of the first big American success. Explorer 1, February the 1st, 1958. We have Bill Pickering, the uh, director of the Jet Propulsion Laboratory, James Van Allen, who discovered the Van Allen belts, did the science experiment, and Werner von Braun, uh, uh, the German rocket engineer. Uh, holding the America's first satellite, or actually a model of it, because they launched the real thing the previous day. Um, and what Werner von Braun did was he took the V2 rocket and stretched it a little uh, and made the Redstone rocket and stuck a bunch of uh, extra motors on top so that when the rocket's at apogee, at its highest point of its trajectory, you fire these motors quickly in succession and accelerate the satellite to the magic 18,000 miles an hour that you need to stay in orbit. Here it is, the first American satellite launch vehicle on the pad, see venting fuel on the night of uh, January 31st, 58. Here are the extra rockets on top, and this little thing right at the top here is the satellite. During this program, uh, I'll, I'll just uh, tell a little bit about uh, some of the technology they did. One of the um, uh, early pieces of technology that they came up with was a thing called the Apogee kick motor. Uh, this is something I've been looking into. When, once you get into orbit, this little dashed line is the rocket coming up and falling back down. The upper stage fires to speed it up and get it into this orbit around the Earth. And for most of the early rockets, you ended up in an orbit where the closest point was actually not that far above the atmosphere, even though the highest point was pretty nice and high. And that meant that friction with the atmosphere made you re-enter quicker than you would like. So what you really want to do is fire another rocket half an orbit later to speed you up and uh, get into a nice circular orbit that won't... Um, uh, uh, won't return. This technique was called by the JPL guy Pickering, uh, he invented it as the giving the satellite a kick in the apogee. Uh, and that's the origin of the phrase apogee kick motor that aerospace people use today. And um, the trick about it was they didn't have any fancy GPS or computers or anything. So what they did was, the, the problem was you've got this rocket that you have to, um, uh, that you have to make sure is pointing in the right direction when you fire it or you won't get the result you want. So how do you make sure it's pointing in the right direction? What they did was they mounted the rocket upside down so that the nozzle's pointing up when you launch it. You get into orbit. At the bottom of the uh, picture, the nozzle's pointing in the direction you're flying. But as it goes around the Earth, it doesn't keep pointing the same direction toward the Earth. It keeps pointing the same direction in space so that half an orbit later, it's now pointing the other direction, in the direction of, uh, of travel, and you can fire it. So all you need is to mount the thing upside down and use a stopwatch for the half orbit it's going to take before you can fire it. Very low technology. They first tried this in uh, the uh, late 1950s. Uh, a satellite uh, launched on the Redstone, and it's this tiny little motor inside the nose cone that was only two pounds weight. Um, unfortunately, that it didn't get to do its stuff. The rocket fell in the ocean, and they didn't use this technique until the 60s. But um, uh, this was uh, a kind of the, the low-tech, what I'm trying to get you is the low-tech uh, approaches that really did some quite sophisticated things. Or not so sophisticated, as in the case of this, America's first satellite launch attempt, the Vanguard, which blew up um, just as uh, uh, it was on the pad in December 1957, uh, got about a few inches off the pad, uh, huge publicity, not very good. Um, Vanguard has a horrible reputation. 
uh, but it's very important historically. The early launches, they, they used this tiny little test satellite weighing only four pounds. They launched three of them to try and get them into orbit, and they had success on the third try. And then they went to this lower satellite, a 20-inch polished sphere containing scientific experiments, the Vanguard sphere. And they launched eight of those, and two of them got into orbit. Um, so this, even at the time, was considered not a good success record. Uh, and the Vanguard program was wrapped up. Some of the Vanguard team went to NASA Goddard to do science satellites, what was then called the Beltsville Space Center, now NASA Goddard, and uh, some stayed at the Naval Research Lab. And in most history books, that's the end of the Vanguard story, except the note that the rocket was used, parts of the rocket were used in the Delta that's still flying today as a very, very successful rocket. But I came across the fact that actually this, the spherical satellite developed by the Naval Research Lab, the 20-inch sphere, had a later interesting history. Although Vanguard was billed as, yeah, it's a Navy program, but it's for purely scientific purposes for the International Geophysical Year. This is why we're better than those guys in the Army down in Huntsville, Alabama. In fact, immediately after the Vanguard program ended, the 20-inch sphere was pressed into service as a secret Navy satellite series launched on other rockets. The first one was the GRAB satellite, which was launched in 1960 as a solar physics experiment. It was studying solar radiation. But unknown to the solar physicists who'd put their experiment in, some other guys at NRL had crept into the uh, hangar in the dead of night and put in their experiment, which was not studying solar radiation. It was studying Soviet radiation. And um, uh, it was the first signals intelligence satellite and studied Soviet radars. And the Vanguard sphere went on as late as 1967 it, a version of it was being used to test out the technology to orient a satellite using the gradient of the Earth's gravity and to do formation flight tests which led on to um, uh, some of the Navy surveillance satellites in use today. So, so the Vanguard legacy in terms of satellites was actually much longer than uh, uh, is usually talked about. Um, how am I doing for time? I'm going to briefly mention Notnik, this um, another Navy program that uh, wasn't known at the time but became more declassified in the 1990s. Here's a little airplane with this little green cute rocket underneath and they flew this plane off the California coast into a, a steep climb and fired it in an attempt to get into orbit. Uh, they tried six times. There are no confirmed successes. The guy who was involved in the program is convinced that one of them did get into orbit. An orbit later, he thinks he heard the signal from the satellite. But uh, as we've seen more recently, often when you're really searching for a faint radio signal in the noise, you think you hear it. Um, and I'm pretty convinced that this thing didn't ever work. Um, uh, and so uh, attempts to launch satellites from airplanes didn't really get going until the 1990s with the Pegasus rocket that's uh, very successful today. Here's the track that they used off the California coast. Much more successful, very important in history, is the Corona satellite program run by the CIA. And uh, the first, um, Corona was very important in the history of the Cold War, in making the SALT treaties possible, uh, in reducing tensions because we knew exactly how many missiles the other side had. It's also very important in the history of space technology, the first satellite to orbit around the poles, the first satellite that to, to be three axis stabilized, which means you can point it anywhere you like, like at the ground, or if you're like me, an astronomer, at a particular star, um, and the first satellite to be recovered from space using this very funky technique. You see uh, in this uh, bottom right picture, uh, a plane goes along dragging a little uh, hook behind it, and they snag the descending satellite's parachute out of the air in midair and uh, bring it back to get its film developed. But getting corona to work was very tricky. The very first attempt to uh, get Discoverer 2 back, the timer was wrong. It landed half an orbit off. And instead of coming down over uh, Hawaii, it came down over the Arctic. And if you've seen the movie Ice Station Zebra, it's based on this. Um, some of them went, they were, fired their retro rocket that went w wrong way and went into higher orbits. Their power supplies failed. Their parachutes failed. Their rockets failed. 
Um, finally, in Discoverer 13, a test flight, they didn't manage to snatch it out of the air, but they did get it back from the sea. And on the very next mission, they flew a, a, a camera carrying satellite, which took the very first spy satellite picture. Here it is, runways of a Soviet air base taken on the 18th of August, 1960. But let's just think about this a minute. Here are the first 14 Discoverer launches, thanks to the uh, photos from the History Archives at Vandenberg Air Force Base. In only a year and a half, they launched 14 missions in this one program. That would never happen today. But even more amazing, the first 13 of them didn't work. Can you imagine getting funding today <laughs> when the first 13 flights <laughs> fail? Uh, so this really tells you the benefits when you have priority funding and political support that's tolerant of failure. And Richard Bissell at the CIA had very strong support from Eisenhower to get this thing working. They knew that the U-2 spy plane was vulnerable and they had to get a replacement for it. So let me just step back a second. I've one out of order here. What I want to point out having talked about some of these early programs, is that the early American space program, this was before NASA, it was run by the military and by the CIA, the Army in Huntsville, Alabama, the Navy in Washington and at China Lake, and the Air Force out at uh, a, a place just south of Los LAX Airport in Los Angeles, as well as the CIA. NASA was formed in 1958, uh, to cover the civilian space programs, but didn't really take over. It was pretty much an umbrella for the first couple of years. It was, wasn't really until 1961 that NASA was really taking the lead in all of its scientific programs, uh, uh, having taken over the old ones. And in 1961, a new space agency, the National Reconnaissance Office, was formed to take the CIA and the Air Force uh, spy satellite programs and uh, deal with those. And that agency wasn't even admitted to exist until the 1990s. So I want to now contrast the American and Russian programs. At the time, there was this big perception, right, that we were behind and the Russians were ahead. And, and the headlines certainly say that. First intercontinental ballistic missile, Soviet Union. First Earth satellite, the Soviet Sputnik. The first living being in orbit, the Soviet dog Laika. The first thing to go into solar orbit and to hit the moon and to take the first far side photos of the moon, the Soviet Luna 1, 2, and 3 probes. The first thing to be recovered from space, the American Discoverer 13 capsule just a couple weeks before its Soviet rival. Actually, no, I think one day before its Soviet rival, if I remember rightly. The uh, Belka and Strelka dogs came down the next day. Um, but we did at least get that one. But then the first human in space, one of the big prizes, Yuri Gagarin, hero of the Soviet Union. So not looking so good for our side if you just look at the newspapers. But it's important to understand there were a lot of different programs going on in the US, both in NASA and outside. We talked about the Explorer and the Vanguard and the Navy NOT satellite and the Corona. There was also lunar probes by the Air Force and the Army, communications, navigation, and early warning satellites for the military, the Air Force SAMOS spy satellite, three separate NASA programs under the Explorer umbrella to understand uh, the science of outer space, as well as the first weather satellites, the, f the first, uh, the echo balloon for communications, and of course the Mercury program that hadn't had an orbital flight at the time I'm talking about, but was gearing up to put Alan Shepard on a suborbital flight and John Glenn in orbit the next year. There were 16 different American satellite programs compared to only five Soviet ones. There were eight different American groups uh, uh, that I've just mentioned compared to only one, the Korolev group, in the Soviet Union, which was getting stretched very thin. And there were six different main types of orbital rocket. We had the Thor and the Atlas, the Jupiter, the Vanguard, and so on. The Russians just had their R-7 missile, and they stuck different stages on top of it. But all those early Russian programs that I told you about were all using the same basic rocket. So our space effort at the time was much broader. We had, we had a much bigger depth of field. And on this slide, I try and uh, compare in a mathematical way who was more successful. Let me uh, skip to the 
non-mathematical slide to give you the, the visual. So here's all the weasel words about, do you count this one, do you count that one? Within the Poisson error statistics, they're the same. Here's the answer. Both of us had a 50% success rate in the first five years of the space program. You had a 50-50 chance of getting something into orbit. The other thing you notice on this slide is we were launching a lot more rockets than they were. They were the first to do almost everything. And we were the second and the third and the fourth and the fifth. And we learned in depth how to do these things. And they just moved on to the next spectacular and didn't have that deeper experience. So in total, of 109 launches, 84 of them were ours. And I think that is one of the big clues as to why within a few years, we were really leading the pack uh, in, the, in, the, uh, in the space race. Another thing that's kind of interesting, the, um, uh, these are details of the particular rockets, but really the key thing is we had a 50-50 success rate on average. Within five years, we were getting in the mid-90s, and so were the Russians. So we figured out how to do it. And what's interesting to me is that whenever some other country has learned how to build their own space rockets, about the same thing has happened. The first few years, they lose about half of them. And then within about five years, if they're launching enough of them, they get up into the mid-90s. And so far, no one has figured out how to get to the 99, 99.9%, .9 and we're still waiting for that one. We want it to be as safe as air travel, and we're a long way from that at the moment. So it seems like you know the French the, the uh, Japanese, the Chinese had the, all the same experience that uh, it's, you start off at 50-50, but it's relatively easy if you stick at it to get to 95%. So I still have a couple minutes. I want to talk, mention a few things that pressed on after this uh, uh, 1961 Kennedy speech. Um, the Air Force had its own spy satellites, the CMOS series, uh, of which my favorite is this one, the E-5. You see this Atlas rocket with a kind of hammerhead nose cone. Um, and uh, this was a pressurized spy satellite capsule that brought the whole camera back and not just the film. Uh, it was launched several times, never worked. One of them re-entered and is thought to be crashed somewhere in northern Canada, never been found. Uh, Apparently, what was really going on was the Air Force and Lockheed wanted to compete for their own Mercury capsule that could carry an astronaut. So they built a spy satellite that could easily, that was pressurized, it had air in it, so it could easily be converted to carry an astronaut. And uh, uh, even though it was actually a pretty sucky design for an intelligence satellite, but they didn't really care as far as I can tell. <laughs> Things that happen in our government. Um, the, the, there was a secret weather satellite that was used to see whether Russia was cloudy, so you shouldn't bother wasting your spy satellite film. It later supported uh, uh, operations in Vietnam and uh, is the ancestor of the modern Air Force weather satellites. Commercial satellites started happening in 1962 with the AT&T's Telstar. And navigation satellites, the ancestors of GPS, started happening as well in the, uh, with the operational system coming online in 1964. And I, I have to finish with this uh, great show of 1960s fashions. Um, uh, and the point that although the, the suborbital exploration of space had been very international, as I showed very early on, the orbital exploration of space had been the superpowers up until this point. But that started changing as early as 1962 with the British aerial satellite, uh, um, British owned, uh, launched in 1962 to study uh, space research, and um, a Canadian satellite called Alouette. And very soon, a lot of other nations started buying their own satellites, initially launched on American rockets, but later other countries developed their own orbital capability. And that led us on the way to the modern space era, which is extremely international, uh, where America is still the most powerful space power, but certainly one among many, rather than the only game in town. 
So thank you very much. I hope that's given you an overview of the early space program and a little more depth than uh, usually you get in the history books, all the great stuff that we found out about. And I'd be, I have some time, so I'm just very pleased to answer any questions you may have and go into more detail on some of these One thing that's important to understand is that every time you launch one of these satellites, the final stage of the rocket goes up there with it. So you've got two pieces of junk to launch at least. And then the orbit. And well, so what happens is if they're in a low orbit, the just remember I said the atmosphere peters out. And you're going at 100 miles up, you come down in a few weeks. But if you're very high up, if you're like a thousand kilometers up, or if you're up in geostationary orbit even higher, you stay up there. So there's um, about 28,000 objects in the satellite catalog right now, and about 10,000 of those, I think, are still in orbit. And the bulk of those are not full satellites, but junk, debris, uh, either from rockets that exploded. There's a sad thing that if you launch uh, a rocket with some fuel left over in it, and the fuel and the oxygen are in different compartments, and the rubber between the compartments erodes, the fuel and the oxygen get together and have a party, and the next time <laughs> that the satellite comes over your radar fence, there are 400 bits instead of one. And if that wasn't bad enough, um, uh, there have been a number of weapons tests issued by the Soviet Union, which would take satellites up and hit them into other satellites and send shrapnel through them, and that generated even more debris. And now we're entering an era where there's a worry of a chain reaction where one piece of debris hits another satellite, creates an orbit. There's been a couple cases of minor collisions so far, but it's only going to get worse. So the good news is that people are now starting to take environmental thinking into space. And uh, the uh, satellite operators, the corporate satellite operators, are very worried because they don't want to lose their own satellites. So they're being very good about things like when your communication satellite is about to run out of fuel, boost it out of the geostationary orbit so it's not going to clutter, clutter up that crucial real estate. Instead of ejecting a lens cap, have it on a hinge. All these kind of people are being much more careful. So I think that hopefully we're in time. And uh, as long as we don't get um, uh, uh, weaponization in space where people are shooting at each other, the, the, the basic debris problem is now at least being paid attention to. Uh, I'm just curious where you guys stand on Vanguard. design of the re-entry test vehicle. And originally the Jupiter C was meant as a re-entry test vehicle. You would you were trying to solve the problem of getting missile nose cones back through the atmosphere at high speed. And so they would launch this thing on a uh, uh, on a suborbital trajectory. But it was very early in its mind, as early as 1953 at least, uh, that uh, by adding fuel to the to the final stage, uh, you could put something in orbit. Lobby for this, and they said, "No, nah, we don't do space. That's that's for uh, science fiction stuff." And uh, it, it's not still not entirely clear how much of that was the Air Force getting recalcitrant, and how much of it was we're already building this super CIA spy satellite, so we don't want anyone else to be talking about space. But but um, certainly the uh, um, there's a famous anecdote. 
he knew uh, Von Braun. Yeah. yeah. So Von Braun was a panmunder <coughs> who had been uh, would later be in East Germany, and uh, he knew the Russians were coming, and he took his uh, papers and his friends and ran west uh, to surrender to deliberately to surrender to the Americans because he figured that he would get a better deal from the United States than he would from. something that, uh, that's happened a number of times. One of the biggest mistakes the United States made was that there was a, a Chinese rocket scientist working at Caltech for the, for the JPL folks in the 50s um, uh, who um, got uh, uh, sent back to China during the McCarthy era because uh, we had too many communist thinkers. So he, went, he, he got ejected from the US and went back to China and promptly took everything he'd learned and started the Chinese missile. That was one of the little wrinkles of the uh, Soviet uh, secrecy system back in the uh, Just a couple of questions. Two, if you're a mathematician, what precisely do you know about astrophysics or Star Trek? <laughs> and the other thing is, as an astronomer, do you go down to South America and still look at the mountains and look at the stars in Africa? Yeah. So um, I got into this partly because uh, my dad worked at NASA the year before the moon landing. Then you go up to the mountain, you 
fun than uh, doing a Hubble observation where you write your ground proposal, you send it off, and a year later you get back a CV in the mail saying, oh, we observed your thing for you. <laughs> uh, we, we did have a great satellite called the International Ultraviolet Explorer, which was in geostationary orbit above the Atlantic, and it was shared between the United States and uh, Europe. And uh, because it was in geostationary orbit instead of circling around the, uh, the Earth all the time, um, we could talk to it directly in real time. So you could actually sit in the control center and go, oh, I'm gonna look at this star now, and I'm done with that, let's go and, and redo that other one. And actually make real time commands to the scientists to say to your navigator, I wanna go to these coordinates, make it so. And that, that, that's gonna be the closest I ever get to the Starship Commander in my career. Yeah. And um, a while back, the equatorial countries, uh, some of them tried to lay claim to the geostationary orbit over their territory. And, but since they didn't have any anti-satellite weapons, that was very hard to enforce. So they kind of died a death. Uh, and um, uh, there's really now a law, and there's a huge field of space law uh, where um, it's agreed that space is an international regime, uh, and it's a bit like the law of the no ownership. Put, sticking the American flag on the moon is explicitly not a legal claim to ownership. Where does space law fit in space, right? You know, I believe that it doesn't, which is a potential problem. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I could just imagine the, um, uh, the law and order episode. You know? <laughs> <laughs> that, that, this comes up as a plot point. <laughs> This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.